We're quite honored to have William Fay join us from Legendary Pictures, and everybody knows about the movie 300 by now. Uh, it was shot on an extremely low budget, considering that it was an epic movie, less than half of what epics cost these days. And it smashed all of the box office records for March, and it's on its way to the record books in several categories. Uh, it's often, uh, Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson has a famous quote that a man casts a long shadow over his organization. And uh, Bill Fay, he was most humble in uh, crediting so many other hardworking people for all the movies that he's worked on. But when you look at the string of the movies that he's produced in his distinguished career, it, there must be a lot of art going on at some level uh, with Bill. And he has, uh, the films to his credit include The Patriot, starring Mel, Glips Mel Gibson, and the blockbuster Independence Day, which at its release was the second highest grossing motion picture of all time, taking more than 800 million worldwide at the box office. And in addition, for six years, he is president of Centropolis Entertainment, one of the most successful production companies in Hollywood. And during that time, Centropolis produced films that total nearly 1.5 billion in worldwide box office and successfully developed digital entertainment ventures such as Centropolis Effects, a top-tier visual effects house, and Mothership.com, a leading sci-fi online vertical sold to USA Networks in June 2000. So what is it uh, that uh, allows you to, time after time, produce hit after hit? And not just hit after hit, but if anyone who witnessed 300, an artistic hit. Something that reached back to all the classical ideals that you see in the great books and classic and brought it to life in a maverick way. I mean, the way they shot that movie, there have been different variations slightly done on that. But that movie was extremely unique on so many angles and such a huge smashing success. So in one sense, it, it was a big risk to bring something like that so new into the world and then just to have a runway hit with it. Uh, just if you do all the math and all the different people and all the different visions, they have to be coordinated to get that together. Uh, it's quite a feat. And uh, Faye is founding partner of and president of production at Legendary Pictures, which in 1995 closed a five-year, 25-picture producing and co-financing deal with Warner Brothers. Legendary has produced, financed, and released seven films with Warner Brothers in the past two years, including the worldwide hits Batman Begins and Superman Returns. Most recently, Mr. Faye was executive producer of the current blockbuster 300. Mr. Faye is also executive producer on three films in progress, including Independence Day, director Roland Emmerich's new film, 10,000 BC. So without further ado, I'd like to thank William Faye for coming out here. Thanks so much. So just a bit of himself, taught never to retreat, never to surrender, taught that death in the battlefield is the greatest glory he could achieve in his life. Spartans, the finest soldiers the world has ever known. It's quiet now. They came from the blackness. Be afraid! Sparta will burn to the ground! of the Persian Empire descend upon you. What must a king do to save his world? Instead, ask yourself, what should a free man do? Threaten my people with slavery and death. This is madness. Madness. This is Sparta! We will stand and fight. A new age has begun. An age of freedom. And all who know the 300 Spartans give their last breath to defend it. Spartans! Tonight we dine in hell! Take from them everything! We're in for one wild night. 
Thank you. It's kind of embarrassing to admit it, but I actually never really get sick of watching that, so <laughs> not yet anyway. Um, I want to thank Dr. E for inviting me here today and for the great introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, when I started thinking about what I would build um, my speech around, I tried to get a bit of context by going to the website and watching, uh, actually ended up watching the speech that John Bogle did, uh, a Vanguard did here about a month ago. I watched that, and my first reaction was complete intimidation. Um, his speech was erudite, it was inspiring, it dealt with important issues and set lofty goals. And, you know, uh, I'm just a film producer. Uh, my second reaction was kind of relief, just the realization that there was a bit of a common thread through his life experience and um, my recent experience around the role of business and society, the important, importance of the constant search for innovation, and the relationship between risk and reward. Uh, my focus today really is sort of on the odyssey of the movie 300 and its relationship to my own personal odyssey with a look at the risks and rewards of both. Um, first, I'd like to give you a little background on myself and, and my company that I'm a founding partner of, Legendary Pictures. Um, I went to Stanford University and then on to UCLA Film School where I had an opportunity to learn a little bit about every part of the filmmaking process. I also got to make a few movies, one of which, to my lifelong delight, uh, won the Jim Morrison Award for Outstanding Student Film. That's uh, right, that Jim Morrison went to UCLA Film School. So. <laughs> Um, after a few years of writing scripts and doing whatever um, sort of film-related work I could get my hands on, I hooked up with a friend of mine from the, my hometown of Seattle who had an idea of, uh, for us to make a film on our own. Uh, so we went it up and started knocking on doors in the Seattle area and ended up raising about $500,000 over the course of a, a long few months um, from Seattle area doctors, dentists, builders, whoever we could get our hands on, literally raising two or $3,000 at a time. Um, we ended up going out and shooting a comedy um, with the inauspicious title of Bombs Away. I was 26 years old. Uh, I'm happy to report that after about 10 or 15 years, we finally got the investors most of their money back. Uh, <laughs> um, I was able to parlay that experience into work in L.A. As a, as a production manager and producer for hire, just sort of really learning my way around here. Um, after a number of years in the business, sort of working as a producer for hire, I was... Uh, I was lucky enough to be offered the job of, Cent of president of Centropolis Entertainment, um, which is Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin's company at the time. Um, I remember thinking about what a great opportunity that was for me to really um, hook up with these filmmakers. Roland Emmerich is an incredibly gifted visual director, and I knew I could just learn an incredible amount from him. And, and being sort of a techno geek, uh, which I am, and being really into the whole sci-fi thing, my film at UCLA actually was a science fiction film based on a Ray Bradbury short story. Um, it seemed like just an incredible opportunity to me. I didn't realize quite what an opportunity it was until I got there and we went out to um, dinner, uh, our very first dinner meeting once I joined the company when they pitched me their idea for their next movie. It was called Independence Day. So um, we kind of got off, uh, got off to a bank. Um, ID4 was an experience really similar to 300 in a lot of ways, which I'll sort of touch on later. Um, it was the beginning of a really fulfilling, uh, productive seven-year experience for me. When we all finally split up a few years ago, I really took some time to think about what I wanted to do next. Um, fooled around, I produced a movie or two here and there, and, and spent a lot of time kind of throwing ideas around with a, a good friend of mine. His name is Thomas Tull, who is a venture capitalist. He was working... Um, in the South. He was originally from New York, but was working in the South at the time, running his own venture fund. And he and I, for years, have been throwing around ideas of, well, you know, what can we do in the film business? How do we, how do we kind of get started in it? And Thomas originally was thinking about buying a, 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 one of the major Hollywood production companies and kind of taking that over and taking their development slate over and kind of um, expanding from there with fresh capital. Um, we threw around a number of ideas. We looked at a number of Hollywood companies, which for many reasons were not great investments. They usually, <laughs> usually aren't. Uh, and we were actually sitting around, strangely enough, on the set of uh, Dean Devlin's movie, new movie at the time, which was called Cellular, and Thomas and I came up with the idea, well, why don't we just start our own company? It was literally as simple as that. Um, we, um, we basically started from scratch, not from scratch, but, but the idea that Thomas came up with, which was brilliant, was to 
structure of film company that private equity would be interested in investing in. Uh, private equity had never really been involved in a major way in film production companies. So uh, the idea was to really craft something around, around that. That was Thomas's background was as a private equity investor. So, um, so we kind of worked out uh, the details of that. And after about 18 months of hard work and some second and third mortgages on the house and uh, near-death experiences, we put the money together and we had our own company. Um, We've built legendary pictures around a few basic tenants that we believed would lead us to success. Uh, the first tenant, which seems obvious, is have lots of money. Um, the reason that that is important is that the film business is, uh, the cold truth is, the film business is a, is a hits-driven business. Um, the hits that you have, which are few, really pay for the many, which is all the films that, that don't, end up being hits. Um, and you need to really be able to weather the spaces between the hits in order to thrive when the hits come. It's, uh, the analogy that we kind of used with our investors was it's like in baseball. I mean, you put a player up three times, he can get three hits or he can strike out three times. If you put him up to bat 25 times, uh, the chances are he'll start to hit to his average. And uh, under that same theory, we raised enough money so that we could make 25 pictures over five years. By the end of that time, I think we'll have a good idea of what our batting average is. Uh, the second tenet is get in business with the best partner. Um, we knew right from the start that we wanted to be in business with Warner Brothers. They've been, had the best long-term track record in the business. They're incredible in terms of selling pictures internationally, which we're enjoying with 300 right now. They've got a great marketing and distribution department. Um, it's it's a really a strong org organization driven by a lot of long-term executives. They have very little turnover there. The third tenet, and this really comes down to sort of our philosophy about filmmaking, is bet on the director. That was something that I felt very strongly about, and I think Thomas does too. And the reason is that the, the director is really the key creative force in a movie, the cre key creative voice. And everything springs from his vision. Um, I think if you look at the films that Legendary has done to date and the films that we've got coming up in the future, um, what you'll find is that they, for the most part, with few exceptions, tend not to be star-driven vehicles. They really are director-centric films built around that single imaginative force. I mean, we're working with Christopher Nolan uh, on Batman. We're working with Brian Singer. We're working with Roland Emmerich. Um, we're working with Spike Jones. We're working with Zack Snyder, of course. Um, those are the kind of, and, and the theory behind this is those are the kind of films that, that if they're built around a director like that, they tend to take the biggest risks, but they tend to have the, the potential for the greatest rewards. So I have another little, little clip to show you. This is where we hold them. This is where we fight. This is where they die! And the shield boys! Remember this day, man. For it will be yours for all time. Spartans! Lay down your weapons! So um, that brings us to 300, of course. Uh, 300, uh, a graphic novel by Frank Miller, was inspired by Frank's experience watching a movie called The 300 Spartans when he was a kid. Uh, that movie, in turn, is based on the epic battle of Thermopylae in 480 BCE, which was uh, a small band of Spartans essentially held off uh, a massive Persian army for three days, allowing the rest of Greece to... Um, rearm and, um, and eventually defeat the Persians. Um, when the project first came to Warner Brothers and Legendary, we, we started, as we always do, by uh, reading a script. There was a script that Zach and, and a, our writer, Kurt Johnstadt, had already worked out. Um, it was a well-written script, but just reading it on its own didn't really give you a real understanding of what the movie could be. Um, 
I'd read the graphic novel, but the idea of making a movie that so boldly stayed true to the graphic novel seemed uh, a bit risky, just to get back to risk and reward. Um, Frank Miller's 300 was brash and operatic, and it was built around characters with very little nuance, who never wavered from their faith, never expressed any inner turmoil. Um, it's not a story with uh, a lot of character arcs, but rather a story of unyielding character. It really, um, it, it really, I think, comes from more the tradition of kind of Wagnerian opera and, and that sort of operatic tradition than it does from any kind of movie tradition that, at least American movie tradition, that we're familiar with. Um, so there was no question that it felt like a, it felt like a risky proposition. Then we actually sat down with Zach and started talking to him about the movie and looking at the images he'd been creating over the last few months, and it was a really impressive display. Zach was completely created, I mean, completely committed to creating the look and feel of a graphic novel on screen. He, he really wanted to stay absolutely true to Frank Miller's vision of, of the story. Um, his storyboards, some of which were taken directly from the graphic novel, literally pains from the graphic novel, showed true inspiration as well as a real mature film sense. Um, the illustrations and mock-ups that he'd done of the creatures that the Spartans would face really sort of hammered home the idea that this wouldn't be any routine telling of the story. It was clear that Zach was a filmmaker with a true overall artistic vision for the movie. Uh, the questions on the table at that point were many, uh, which was how many people are going to buy into a stylized, violent, fantastical account of a 25-year-old, 100-year-old battle? Can you fill an account of an actual historical battle with so many characters from fantasy? I mean, if you, uh, those of you who've seen the movie know what I'm talking about with the mutants and the five-fingered, uh, five-fingered immortals and the elephants and the rhinos and the whole, the whole works. Um, can you draw your characters in such clear archetypes um, that, as I said, isn't really part of American filmmaking tradition? Is that going to work in a modern motion picture? Would the audience stand for an entire epic story being told not with megastars leading thousands of extras charging across picturesque landscapes, but rather relatively unknown actors leading 40 men charging across a soundstage in front of a blue screen? So. <laughs> We, you know, if we agreed to move on forward on the project, there was no question that, at least for Legendary, that was, this is the riskiest project we'd ever done. On the other hand, the, the, the history of the movie business shows sort of a paradox at work in terms of the audience's response to a film. If you make a safe film that delivers what the audience expects, then you have a reasonable chance of earning a, a reasonable return. If you make something original and wholly unexpected, then you risk abject failure, but every once in a while, lightning strikes and you energize and excite the public because you're showing them images that they've never seen before. You're, su you're surprising them. And it's kind of a funny the way that paradox works, that people will tend to be drawn toward things that they're familiar with, but every once in a while, if, if you can give them something that, that really kind of rocks them a little bit, then you can get a buzz going that you just can't create any other way. Um, I'm happy to report that we at Legendary believe the risk was worth the uh, potential reward. Uh, <laughs> I have on one or two occasions over the last three weeks uh, considered what it would be like right now if we hadn't. And uh, I wouldn't want to be taking the calls from my investors, trust me. Um, I can only stand it for a second or two before I sort of give a shudder of dread and move on. I um, just want to show you a couple of the images maybe that we uh, give you an idea of uh, the filmmaking process. This essentially is what we're looking at just about every day of the film is lots of green screens and blue screens and, um, and our 10, 20, 30, 40 actors parading around in front of them. Um, the movie was greenlit at a cost of about 64 million or less. Yeah, that's pretty, uh, pretty frightening and impressive, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it was greenlit at a budget of about $64 million, which is about half the cost of what an average Hollywood epic uh, runs these days. Um, it was at this point where sort of the audacity of the concept meshed perfectly with the constraints of the budget. Um, shooting an entire movie indoors meant that we could shoot anywhere in the world. So literally, we went, we looked everywhere. We looked to New Zealand, Australia, Canada, um, Eastern Europe. Um, we eventually ended up going to Montreal, which offered us a really great package of incentives. 
And one of the reasons Montreal was offering that pack package of incentives was it was the middle of winter in Montreal, and nobody in their right mind would be shooting a movie up there at that time of year unless they were doing something where everybody was inside. Um, so we ended up finding a giant warehouse up there and moved the production up to Montreal. Of course, the, you know, the only negative probably was uh, for our leather speedo clad Spartans um, <laughs> trying not to make sure they didn't have to go outside in the 10 degree below zero weather. Um, staying true to the design of the graphic novel also presented advantage for the visual effects work. Uh, just about every single shot in the movie is a visual effects shot. There are a few shots in Sparta, uh, the city of Sparta, and a few very tight shots against rocks that aren't visual effects, but, but probably 85% of the movie is visual effects shots. Um, so it, it actually turned out, as we got into it, it's, it's much easier to create a stylized, I mean, create effect shots for a stylized look than it is to create the hyper-real shots that you think about when you think about a movie like Troy or something like that. Those are incredibly expensive shots. And we were actually able to do shots at a fraction of that price because we were going for a, for a very stylized, um, unrealistic look. And that was really, as I said, out of necessity, that was the only way we were going to get the movie made for the amount of money that the studio was willing to spend on it. But it also really worked for us in terms of executing the production plan. So from there on, it was sort of on to the shoot. Um, as the entire thing was um, shot in front of a blue screen, we only shot for 60 days, which is an incredibly short schedule for a movie of this size. Um, and that's really where we got to see the full extent of Zack's ability, Zack Snyder. Um, not only had we chosen, chosen a talented visualist, but he turned out to be a great general too, running the set with what you might call Spartan discipline and efficiency. Uh, he was a cheerleader, a motivator, a humorist, um, was one of the few guys that I've had the pleasure of working with who just elevates a film set when he walks on it with his strength of personality. The other guy that comes to mind for me is Will Smith from when we worked together on Independence Day. Just a guy who raises everybody's ability and imagination 50% when they walk on the set. Um, he was up to the challenge of putting his actors in front of a blue screen and getting them to visualize what was happening around them in the virtual world. I can think of all the times he was in front of uh, Jerry Butler and all the Spartans going, okay, now there's a giant elephant up here and he's attacking you. So, you know, uh, there was a lot, of that, a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Um, it, strangely enough, turned out that the fact that we were working with mostly English classically trained actors uh, turned out to be a huge plus because, strangely enough, stage actors are, are more used to the whole, a whole non-real uh, environment than film actors are. So they were more experienced at creating and visualizing the imagery around them, sort of what the world would be like once um, we did all our effects magic. Um, I'm just going to go through a few images here and give you uh, a look at sort of how, um, how we created, created this, really from sort of the graphic novel images to um, the uh, uh, to sort of piecing together the various parts of, of the puzzle. Really, we started with um, taking the pains from the graphic novel, and we had um, a conceptual illustrator named Grant Freckleton, who is actually a full-time dedicated visualist on the film. The first time I've ever worked under this sort of, uh, uh, with that sort of a person, just dedicated only solely to the look of the film. Um, and the idea, again, was to faithfully re recreate the look of the film around the, the imagery of the graphic novel. Um, so Grant's full-time job was really to think about that. What, what, what he would do is he would design the computer-generated backgrounds for each scene based on panes from the graphic novel and Zach's storyboards. And uh, then that would go off to the 3D department to build this, this whole 3D world of, that, of those images. Then we would really, then we'd shoot the live action, like this blue screen plate, comp the images together, and then Grant would work with, uh, on a computer, would work with the foreground action to really get it to marry the look of the background action. So um, some of the pieces were more complex than others, but they really ended up fitting together um, very, very well. Um, as the shoot kind of went along, I, I was starting to get a, a kind of an amazing feeling that all of the serendipity that we were running into had a meeting. Um, and just thinking back to the one time I'd ever experienced that before, all those happy coincidences, and 
The answer was Independence Day, and where it seemed like everything that was an obstacle became a benefit. Everything that, uh, every, every block in the road that we had to get by somehow turned out to be, turned out to motivate us in the direction that actually turned out to be better than what we originally planned. Um, so, and they, and they were both sort of grand scale movies, movie, like grand scale epic movie wannabes that we were trying to do at the cost of, you know, half the cost of what you would usually set out to do something like this. So that feeling, sort of that, that link to the only other experience that I'd ever been through on that sort of scale, Independence Day, uh, was kind of reinforced when I saw the first cut of the film. Um, the film was every bit the movie that Zach sent out to make, which I don't think I've ever experienced before in terms of a, a filmmaker just having a complete vision of exactly what he wanted to create. From the first time we sat down with him and him executing every piece of that plan and putting it together, and I think that in a way is as important as sort of the arresting images, as an Im important as sort of the, the acting style and the operatic style of it is, is, is a key to the success of the movie. It really, um, it, I, I think people really, when you watch the movie, you really feel like you're watching somebody's complete vision. Um, we took a, a bit of that film to Comic-Con, um, which is the comic book convention down in San Diego uh, last, July, and um, the response there was was huge. And from that point, again, like Independence Day, the buzz just started to build and build and build on this picture and took on a life of its own. It wasn't, I mean, in both of those films, we I remember reaching a point where we felt like the whole, the whole marketing and the film's perception and everything else was pretty much completely out of our control. It was sort of taken over by the public. People had seen the images in the film and everything just sort of started spreading by word of mouth. There wasn't, it, we were just sort of watching the snowball start to roll downhill. It wasn't something we were even controlling. And that's, that's really an incredible feeling to have and a, and a really exciting thing when you've got a film uh, approaching release and, and that kind of buzz is going ar on around it. I mean, by the time the film opened, I think, it, there's, we couldn't even keep up with the constant increase in sort of what our expectations for it were. So we'll show one, we'll show one more clip from the movie. Like I said, I never get sick of watching it, so. Who we'll surrender? That is Spartan law. And by Spartan law, we will stand and fight and die. A new age has begun. An age of freedom. And all who know that 300 Spartans gave their last breath to defend it. Oh, oh, oh. He trains with these guys. He's into martial arts. He's, you know, he's like a Navy. Go ahead. Play a little bit of um, our actors talking about Zach, because uh, I was referring to that a little earlier, just sort of the inspiration. Picture the Xerxes up, and I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> he threw it. He hit the picture, which was miles away, and it carried through the picture and ripped a hole. And he's, he's talking about Zach throwing right a spear at so I knew, and a I knew photo of that. Xerxes. There's no way I was going to do that. We played bulls one day in the courtyard, and we're throwing, I wasn't getting it. Nobody was getting really that close. Every time he landed within like an inch. He's just one of those guys, whatever he does, it turns to gold. He's very talented, he's very athletic, he's very sporty, and he gets the soul of this story. You know, I just think Zach's got a real kind of vision on it all. And you can see it when he's making it. He knows exactly what he wants. He's like, yeah, we got it. Or, you, he, you know, you're really, you're really directed down a certain road, which is brilliant, because there's no confusion. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be pretty cool, actually, in that it'll attract a lot of people. <laughs> he's got like, he's got childlike energy, really. I think it's because he so loves the source material. You know, he so wants to make this what he sees in his head to be what he sees on the page. You know, it's kind of like he's made that pact with himself that whatever happens, he will create Frank Miller's 300 and get it just right for the screen. 
So um, I guess for me, it's sort of what lessons are learned from 300. Uh, for me as an executive and as a producer, it's obviously just reinforces the fact that you have to take risks if you want to make something that's really going to cap capture people's imagination. Um, as I said before, I think a big part of the response to 300 has just been the freshness of it. Um, and when you look back at pictures that have done the same thing, I think about things like, well, Independence Day or The Matrix, those kind of films, they really do almost have to come a little bit out of left field if you're going to really get people excited about something. So it's really for us trying to find and discover sort of what the next turn in the road is. Um, in, in that regard, I mean, w you know, we sort of look to what the future of filmmaking holds. I mean, I think this, you're going to be seeing a lot more films, uh, actually probably more than you want to at this point, because I think every studio is, as far as I know, has got something that they're doing that's going to be just like 300. So, uh, so the question is, well, where do we, you know, what's the step after that? And, um, you know, there's some very exciting things going on right now. I mean, I was at the set of Avatar a couple of weeks ago, Jim Cameron's new film, and which is being done in 3D, real-time motion capture. And, and it's, it's a completely new level of filmmaking that really excites me. I'd like to be doing something along those lines. Um, and so our job is really to be out there, really exploring where, where we take this technology and where we take... Um, the art form of film next that's going to keep people inspired and surprised. Um, as far as Legendary goes, I mean, we've, as, as Dr. E mentioned, we're doing a film with Roland Emmerich, which I'm very excited about. We've got uh, The Rights to World of Warcraft, the online game, which we're, we're working right now on a script to get that into movie form. We are uh, taking on what I think is probably the biggest challenge you could possibly ever mount. We're, we're working on a film adaptation of Milton's Paradise Lost, which we call sort of 300, but with wings. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's a really, I mean, that's something that I think could be one of those films that really sort of stretches the current boundaries of what you imagine you can do in filmmaking. We're doing a film with Spike Jones right now, who I think is an incredible innovator and creator called Where the Wild Things Are, based on the children's book. So um, I'm very excited for the future and just uh, know it's going to be just a wild and exciting ride. So I want to say thanks, and um, if anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to take some questions. Yes. That, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah, I think I think that is true. I mean, particularly in the case of 300, I think um, as we talked about earlier, there was uh, when you read the script of this, it was really hard to sort of get your head around the dialogue you really had to think about it because it didn't feel like film dialogue. It felt like, it felt like, it felt like opera or speeches. It felt like, it felt like these characters basically laying out what their soul was about and it never wavered. The, it's, as I said, there wasn't a lot of nuance in, in the script. There wasn't a lot of nuance in the, in the character. They were very, very sharply drawn and, it, and that really worked, I think, against people's expectations of what you see in a film, but I, just to agree with your point, I think it worked for that, those, that sort of idea of, your, of, of the ideal. Why is it so difficult to make I think just because they're... Uh, you know what, I don't know. I, I, I guess the, the, it'll be interesting to see what the next step is. I mean, when I talk about Paradise Lost, there's a bit of that kind of feel in Paradise Lost for us. I mean, if you think about... Not that we're going to stay exactly true to Milton's dialogue, because that would be very tough, but I think that in terms of the tone of it and everything, it really is about, I mean, we're talking about Lucifer and Michael and, I mean, Adam and Eve. You really are talk talking about archetypes, and it's, I, I think that film will sort of fall into a bit of that same category. But I, I think that, you know, the, 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 always the, the overriding tendency in the business is to want to play it safe a little bit. I mean... Even as a company, I mean, we're, you know, I'm happy to say that we're doing the sequel to Batman Begins, and 
you know, I think it's going to be great, and we've got a great director, but it's probably a, a less risky project than, <laughs> than this was. Um, yes? Uh, fairly hands-on. I mean, I think um, it's kind of hard to enumerate all the roles of uh, of a producer or producers in a film, but but an important part of that is as a sounding board for the director. Um, the the pressures that go with making a, a film um, as a director are incredible, and I, I really do feel that every director I've worked with with almost gets a little bit insane during the actual process of shooting the movie because of the pressures that are on them. I mean, literally, you've got hundreds of people depending on your every sentence. You've got to make a decision every five seconds and somehow keep this entire film in your head. And I think the producer's job is to really be a sounding board for the director and, and, and really try and, try and tease out of them exactly what it is they want and find a way to get it for them. And if you feel there's... Uh, you know, if you feel them sort of straying from what you think it is they want to do, just sort of gently reminding them what, where you want to go from there. And also, the, the producer's job really is to, to be a, um, a sort of buffer between the studio and the director, because obviously the studio has a, a vested interest in the film and is spending a lot of money, and they want to know what's happening with the film, and you, you've really got to be there to sort of um, keep the lines of communication smooth. Yes? We are non-exclusive to Warner Brothers, um, but we have a great partnership there, and every film we set out to make, the, the plan is always to make it with Warner Brothers. Yes. Sir, uh, yes, yes, in the way back. He, yeah, we basically had the sketches, the original sketches, and we had to sort of imagine. And Zach had those on the set. And as I said, he would literally say, okay, this is what's behind you, these five million Persians that are charging up the hill. Um, and Grant, it was a process. I mean, Grant worked on, on those illustrations as we continued on. And, and, um, but we really didn't have a lot of the 3D finalized um, sets back, the virtual sets back until we'd already shot the film. So it was really a lot about sitting there with the actors and saying, here's, here's the piece that you're going to fit into. Then what we would do is we'd, we'd shoot the film, and the first couple of days we actually tried to take the dailies and every day create the look um, that we were striving for, and we realized that was just a physical impossibility. It was going to take forever, and everybody's tearing their hair out. So what we would look at is essentially what you're looking at here. I mean, non-retouched film dailies that sort of look, uh, you know, look kind of terrible. Um, I'm talking about, the, yeah, when you get to the, the blue screen stuff, it's, I mean, we look at those every, we look at, at stuff like this every day and then, and then just imagine how it was going to fit in. And it, it, there's a certain sort of leap of faith that goes in there, but. I think it'll, it, it's, I mean, given the, the number of shots that we had, it wasn't a particularly long post-production. It was, um, it ended up being about a year, but if we had to, we probably couldn't have been done in 10 months. I mean, we could have been done for this picture to re release in, during the holidays if we'd wanted to, but we, at that point, we'd really pitch, pick the March slot. So, you know, the work sort of expands to fill the time. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, we have. <laughs> that was the first thing I thought of when I was down on the set of Avatar. What movie would look really great in 3D? So, whether we get there or not, I don't know. I mean, there's still a lot. Uh, by the end of this year, there's supposed to be about 700 digital 3D capable th uh, screens in the United States, but that's expanding every year. And I mean, obviously, Cameron's film is released in 2009. He's planning on. 3D being the primary release mode for the film. Yeah, like I, well, I heard uh, Robert Rodriguez talk, and you know, he started with Spyfit, and he was going like internationally because most people go out and say, "Okay, I haven't even been exposed to this, but it's just 3D. It's awesome." So 
Right. In the 50s with House of Wax and all those pictures, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes? Well, we buy, and, and I stress that I'm one of a number of producers and executive producers on this film. There were a lot of people that put a lot of hard work into it. Um, the thing that we had working for us on this film was that it was, uh, that we, that Zach was going to do it at a real price for the size of the picture. And, and really, we sort of bought, uh, he bought a certain amount of autonomy by being willing to do the film at a price. Actually, the first time we, we budgeted this film out, it was going to cost about $90 million. And um, the word came back from the studio saying, do you want to make that movie? Well, it can't be R-rated, first of all, because we're not going to spend that much money on an R-rated picture. And if you do want to make an R-rated picture, then you need to figure out how to cut 20 to $25 million out of the budget. And, and Zach literally didn't even think about it. He said, okay, then we'll make it for 65, 64. And it was a matter of figuring out from them. But the fact that we were able to keep that below a certain price gave him a lot more autonomy to make the picture that he wanted to make. I mean, you can take, the, obviously, the cheaper the, the film, the more risks you can take. That's what I was talking about before. When we're making a film like Batman or Superman, we have to appeal to all four f of what they call the film quadrants. We have to appeal to young males, old males, young females, old females. I mean, and you've got to, I mean, when you're making a film like that, you've got to get millions and millions of people to see your movie. This, this just gives you a little more freedom. Sorry, Dan. Uh, we worked with MySpace to come up with that, to come up with the idea of it. Um, and its effectiveness, I, I, it seemed to be very effective. And it's... Uh, I have no idea. I don't. I, because the thing is, what? Speak into the mic, Naya. <laughs> told me I wasn't going to have to talk at this thing. Uh, our first day, I think we got about a million people hitting onto the actual friend site and um, about 30,000 friends. So it's, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean, I think it was really a great decision for us and it, w it really worked well. It's just, it's, it's hard to judge exactly how much of that came through the MySpace experience and how much of it was just the, the nature of the images. I mean, when we started putting these, these images out, they got a lot of response wherever we put them. But it was a great, it was a great tool for us. It really worked well. Yes, back there. Yeah, we do. I mean, for example, Roland Emmerich's film is, is a wholly original script. Um, I, I don't think there's any tendency for us to, to go one way or another, to tell you the truth. I mean, again, when you get, when you get down to the studio um, bottom line of it all, uh, once you get above a certain budget, there's a lot of insurance for the studio in having something that's a pre-existing property, like a World of Warcraft or something like that. If you're starting out to do something from scratch, it's, uh, it's, it's a bigger gamble, but it, again, as we've just talked about, it's also potentially a bigger payoff. Yes, in back. I'd say we're looking outside most of the time. I mean, we're, we're we have good relationships with all the major agencies and we're constantly getting scripts in from them. They, they have an idea of the kind of movie we like to make. Um, and obviously we have, a, we have our own connections with certain directors that we know we like to work with. Whatever project they're doing next, I mean, whatever Zach's doing next, whatever Roland is doing next, whatever, you know, whatever Chris Nolan is doing next, we're always going to be interested in taking a look at. Yes? 
Yeah, uh, Johnny Ninari of Hollywood Gang was involved with it right from the start. He actually optioned the rights to, uh, to Frank Miller's graphic novel, and he brought it to us and to Warner Brothers. He was, in, he was, it was a long slog for him. Any other questions? Great. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Just wanted to thank Bill Fay again. Thanks so much for coming out. We also have a t-shirt for you. Hey. And you'll notice we have a quote uh, from a familiar movie. It says, a new age has begun, an age of freedom. And that could be said for uh, what you guys have done with that movie, uh, doing on a small budget for the studios. Great. Thanks, Elliot. Yeah. Somebody, one of the students wanted to put a different quote from the movie, the one that said, this is going to last a long time, you will not enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> do you remember that? That's great. But we, we decided on this quote. It's a much, much more fitting. We also had a hat for you, Hero's Journey, but they all got taken by somebody or other. I don't know. Next year we're going to sell them. A little bit of entrepreneurship. Right. Uh, and we also have a copy of uh, John Bogle's Battle for the Soul of Capitalism and the Odyssey. But, thanks so much. Thanks. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks again. Yeah.